thank you very much for hosting me here tonight. You must welcome, sir. Um, uh, incidentally, I was here again um, last week. Okay. Uh, it's Friday, actually, uh, in the middle of the week, I should say. Um, and uh, when I was asked this question, I pondered all the answers and say, where do you begin to tell a story of a giant? Where do you begin to tell a story of a titan? Um, but allow me, perhaps, in starting, to try and remove a common mistake that is usually made to always look at Winnie Mandela through the prison of her being Nelson Mandela's wife, or being a support of the other part of Nelson Mandela. Yes, she was married to Nelson Mandela. And um, yes, most of the time when people think of her, they would automatically. But she was her own woman, woman on her own right. What I'm trying to say is that we should not in uh, characterizing or maybe trying to define who she was, only relegate her to having been Nelson Mandela's wife. If you rightly remember, if I were to be asked to, to characterize who Winnie Matigizela Mandela was, Wilfred, Winfred, and Nomzamo Matigizela, who was born in the village of Pizani. Um, she was a young lady who, from a family that was quite educated, both parents were teachers. 1936, to have both parents as teachers was, was a rare occasion because uh, of the system of racial segregation. Uh, but uh, she managed to raised through the education system to matriculate. When matriculating was, was, was a rare occasion as well, and even went to university um, to become a social worker. Social working, those times, if you remember, apartheid has the system of uh, preserving certain categories of work to certain races. Um, the, the, the primary objective of, of apartheid, if you will, was to forever relegate black people as heroes of wood and drawers of water, economic subjugation. But she was in another level. She rose, became a graduate, and a social worker. But because of the time and period she found herself in of apartheid, she had to take up the war because she used to talk with her parents to say about the land, the wars that Africans had to wage against the colonizers to say what happened to the land, when are we gaining back the land? And she was taught the dispossession, about the dispossession of Africans by her parents. And as such, from a young age, she developed that consciousness to say an injustice has been committed against my people long before she ever met Nelson Mandela. So by the time she met, excuse me, by the time she met Nelson Mandela, she was well aware of the political situation in South Africa and was already an activist. I think for I, could, I can pause here for a while. Okay. We um, still have an hour, so there's yeah, a lot of um, things we can Doc, can't. I'll come to you pretty shortly. Mm -hmm. um, Your Excellency, you, you've given quite an interesting preamble. Um, some people will ask, how did such a diminutive woman <laughs> defy the odds, so to speak? Did she attend Ivy League schools? Uh, was she born to rich parents or they were ordinary peasants? How did she brave the storm? to reach the very pinnacle of education in an apartheid South Africa? You know, um, I think she had the opportunity as well. Um, 
like I said in my preface, I said that both parents were, were teachers. And um, she was able to study, um, to matriculate, um, and to continue to university. And remember, during those days, we also had um, missionaries. missionaries. Uh, so these missionaries we, we would uh, assist in many instances, because they were also not um, pleased with the subjugation and uh, uh, the perpetual uh, denial of education to Africans, and they helped a lot. And as such, there was a combination of issues or a combination of factors that able, enabled her to continue her studies. But would you say she had a jolly ride? I would not say that. I would not say that she had a jolly ride. Um, because education is and was even then very expensive. And uh, the apartheid machinery sought to put every obstacle in the way of an African who tried to acquire education to better themselves. Because they were quite aware that knowledge was an instrument or a weapon that Africans would employ to defeat or to dispel and discount the myth of apartheid. So they were putting all ab obstacles in the way of any African who sought to excel in education. Okay. Doc, um, both of us had an interaction with the ex Excellency, the Deputy High Commissioner, before we came. Quite a vociferous and outspoken man, um, but in a quite patriarchal uh, continent, on a part, you know, a man-centered <laughs> continent, the success of a woman is always an appendage to the legacy her husband leaves. And he seems to have, you know, established an impressive dichotomy that, well, she started doing what she was doing. She was a resistant fighter way before she met Nelson Mandela. Would you be comfortable decoupling the kind of legacy African women would want to see her bequeath to them uh, away from the kind of influence she had getting married to Nelson Mandela? Well, let me clarify the point that uh, while the African system and particularly or generally the international system is patriarchal, that is a male-dominated society, uh, during apartheid, women's rights or um, kind of respecting women or treating women better was the order of the day. The idea then, according to apartheid, was to kind of dehumanize men as to what kind of, uh, I want, um, kind of make them less of a man, um, to embarrass them. You know, even the women that have not been to school, those that work um, as maids and other things, they had direct contact with the children of what the white people, they cook in the kitchen and um, that sort of thing. So they were treated more properly um, than uh, the men. So from that perspective, that is an issue. I think the major issue is that uh, Winnie Mandela's, uh, Mandela was conscious of um, the situation into which he was born. And um, from what uh, His Excellency has said, uh, if you were to be someone that is what indifferent to the situation, the plight of what blacks, you would have enjoyed the comfort of the home into which he was born. Uh, but uh, as it was um, in the 60s, 70s, and um, 80s, the whole of Africa was agog, asked what fight appetite. There were songs that were what played by musicians across Africa and that sort of thing. And Winnie Man uh, Nelson Mandela was particularly um, noticed, um, <laughs> given the fact the very day that he met Nelson Mandela at a bus stop, and eventually that what grew into a marriage, and they having two children. And then um, at a very tender, or a very, uh, what would I call it, prime stage of their marriage, the husband was taken away. He could even at that stage recoil and say, well, I have two children, my husband is not here, let me take care of them. But he did, she didn't do that. And then what? Got hold of appetite, a fight against appetite with two hands. And um, she was very, very active. 
became the women's wing leader <coughs> and took charge of what? The uh, Mandela Football, uh, United Football Club, and uh, did several things. And um, because of that, she suffered a lot of what? Um, embarrassment, maltreatment, torture, and was even banished from the city to go and live in the countryside and that sort of thing. Um, this said and done, I think the lesson for Africans is that the battle is not over wherever you are found or wherever you are located. Uh, we should be concerned about the environment and the context within which we live. Um, this is what I can say. That okay, a few pictures are rolling on your streets. Um, Willie Mandela with her husband, both of them deceased now. Um, 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 Your Excellency, um, Doc makes quite an interesting point that you grew up in apartheid as well. Yes. That the women were given better opportunities than you. Of course, you were filled with testosterone, and if you <coughs> were not dehumanized, you would stand up against the system at that time. And does it really both true for the kind of the new colonial system you grew up in? Let me first, I know that I did a preface, but allow me to once again, whilst trying to define Winnie Mandela, to first locate her within the greater history or the larger history of South Africa in ever so, ever so broad strokes. Let me do that in, in broad strokes. Firstly, you may recall that in 1910, that was the establishment of the Union of South Africa. 1948, you have the introduction of apartheid, the institutionalization of, of, of apartheid. Um, 1961, you have the republic formed. But the formation of the Union of South Africa, institutionalizing racial segregation and apartheid are not the beginning of racial discrimination in, in South Africa. That started a long time ago during the time of, colon, uh, of, of uh, the, the, the occupation. There were colonies of Britain, I think there was Cape, there was Natal, there was Transvaal, there was the Orange Free River, and then you had the Boer Republic. But the sole purpose of it, <laughs> or what characterized that period, that era, was the dispossession of Africans, of their land, of their livestock, of their livelihood. So it is within that context that South, South African Africans found themselves and we were very good and we still maybe we are losing that somewhat the art of telling a story history of our people is told around fires at night the custodians would be the agent they will tell you where you come from your history the wars that you fought your conquests what you have lost in great minute detail so it was true also for Winnie Nomzamo, Matilizel, that she got to know her history and have a forward-looking um, aspiration of liberating or correcting the ills of the past. As far as the treatment of women, I have a slight, slightly different uptake on the role of women or how women were, were, were treated. If anything, I tend to think that they had a double jeopardy. They were subjugated at the home and they were subjugated at work. So what the doctor is alluding to is apartheid, remember, it had public and social segregation. Mm. Now the social segregation that he's alluding to is that they had access to the children of, of the madans, of the white people, they were the ones who were uh, cooks in the house, they were the cleaners, they were, you understand? So in that context, yes, they were there, clear, near. But in the whole scale, when you look at the hierarchy, they are at the bottom. Even today as we speak, they still have to 
overcome um, economic dis uh, disadvantages of first being black, second being women. If you look at the economic situation in South Africa, you'd have the white male, generally African, eh? and then you would have even the, the, the women who are African and women are also were ex excluded largely from the, from, 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 from the economic activity. So you have women who are both white and black being excluded with, at different levels, of course, from the economy. So I think I'm just trying to put context in what the doctor is saying. It's not saying that they had it any easier. If anything, they bore the brunt just as much as anybody at the hands of a uh, Doc, I believe um, uh, His Excellency's position is not a market departure no, from yes. what no, you no, were alluding no. to. Um, what um, he's just said is very Maybe right. playing with the kids the of white folks, you could, how the did they communicate? Was it in English? In the sense <laughs> that yeah. it was easier for a woman us to get closer to the white people. Okay. For a black man being found at the wrong place alone sends you to jail. Um, this was the context within which I was yeah, talking. Exactly. Okay. Uh, but then, um, as he has rightly pointed out, um, you are married to a man, a man that is dehumanized, a man that cannot raise money as to cater for you. No matter how well you are treated at work with the white folk, becomes a problem. Um, I don't want us to go into that sociology mm -hmm. or the psychology of it, that the problem it created uh, for man-woman relationship during the apartheid era. And the point I'm just trying to say is that um, women were more tolerated um, in terms of social relations, but in no way were they accorded economic power or any form of recognition better than the men. And mm -hmm. our system being such, they were <coughs> often kind of what? Disillusioned and have a lot of nostalgia um, when they see their men becoming so dehumanized and that sort of thing, and they don't have any power. And as he has pointed out, they were dispossessed of the land and that sort of thing. Uh, but what I was trying to point out is that Nelson Mandela never faced the crisis that she, she did until she became political. It was when she became an activist and began organizing women, began organizing the youth, particularly through sports, that he was recognized as what a troublesome woman who has to be disciplined, for, uh, so to say. And uh, she has been arrested, detained, uh, kidnapped, tortured, and um, when they realized that they could not keep her quiet, she was banished from coming to town. Mm -hmm. And town was such that that is where you can cause real trouble. If you are sent to the countryside, <laughs> nobody notices you, that sort of thing. Um, so um, this is what I'm pointing out, that um, uh, she lived up to what? The demands of the time, the challenges of her time. And um, she sacrificed all her time. Um, in the latter years, probably we'll be touching on that, we realized that she was equally human and um, she has some frailties that catch up with her with time. That eventually led to her uh, divorce from the husband and that. <coughs> uh, but so to speak, as I was pointing out, that at a very tender uh, stage of their marriage, they were separated. And uh, women will best attest to this fact that uh, your husband not being with you in raising your children and even the comfort of the night has been a very trying moment. But uh, for a long time in South Africa, she had been the face of what? anti apartheid and had led a lot of what? Fight against the whites. And normally, she should have been quiet and all. She should have been subdued. But then she always rose above the turbulence of what? The punishment that she was okay. What, suffering. Okay, and um, this is how we're going to do it. Let's casually look at <coughs> Winnie Mandela pre Mandela's time in prison and during his time in prison and immediately after that. Um, Doc has indicated she was more of the poster girl <laughs> for the resistance against apartheid. Um, could the witness approach have been any different 
and in this age of digital media, social media, and all that, and how was she able to uh, always be the focal point of attention, apart from the troublemaking? You just don't make trouble, you make sensible <laughs> trouble. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Winnie Mandela is unique, yes. She stood out, yes. And, uh, but, but what I want to say is that she's just a sample of the leadership, the women leadership that we have in South Africa. <coughs> there are her forebears and her contemporaries. Um, you have lady, people like Fatima Mia. You have Gertrude Chope. Uh, quite a number of them, uh, of ladies who were you know, Albertina Sisulu, uh, a number of ladies who are Lillian Goyi, quite a number of you them. as pronounced as she was? Exactly. Okay. Uh, but okay. what happened, I think there was a deliberate uh, move by the African National Congress. Remember, what happened is, uh, first it started with Mandela, to make Mandela the face of the resistance then he becomes that focal point. But in elevating Mandela, it so vexed the apartheid regime that they began to dehumanize and brutalize Winnie, who also just could not and would not go quietly into the night. She agitated. She was an eloquent speaker, well-spoken, articulate, uh, loquacious, if you will. She, 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 she <laughs> had the gift of the spoken word. Wow. She could put feeling into a word and relevance into a speech as if she was talking to you. Individually, as if she's looking at you. That's how she became the mother of the nation. Because your pain was like, <clears throat> something that she feels personally and the yoke of oppression which the apartheid government um, put on her was difficult was heavy but she bore it like you said that let's look at the time when Nelson Mandela was now in prison uh, most freedom fighters were in exile um, Others were arrested, others had gone into hiding. She was offered the opportunity herself to leave the country, to say you can go to Swaziland, you can go where you want. But she knew that if she were to leave South Africa, she was not coming back. And she said, I'm going to suffer with my people. That's why she transcends political affiliation, whether you belong to this party or that one. She became the mother of the nation precisely because she was speaking for everybody across political lines. Whether you were youth, whether you were a woman, uh, women organizations, students, workers union and all that. She empathized because it's a, it's a pain that she felt personally herself. And in so doing, <coughs> excuse me, she attracted again and again the wrath of the security forces in the middle of the night they would kick in the doors with the flimsiest of excuses append bedrooms leave the house in a state of you know disrepair for heaven knows what she was arrested on several occasions but all this while most of the abuse was verbal she didn't suffer any bodily harm, did she? Actually, um, there, there were very many torture uh, techniques which the apartheid regime used. You will come out without a scratch, but they would have dealt with you. They had methods of calling others, they would call it helicopter, they would put you on a brick, they would do all manner of things. And they you. did that to win? Of course they did. So it was not only verbal, 
or solitary confinement. No. She also went through those things. And that is why <clears throat> we have this thing, I was saying it in the last week, that they say, Watintabafazi, um, Watintibooto, meaning you strike a woman, you strike a rock. The woman was tough. She took it all and she kept on fighting. That was the character of Winnie Mandela. You know, I was saying um, our president uh, recalled the songs of, the words of a song of Hugh Masikela when he was saying, Tumamina, meaning send me. Sumame, I take. Yes. That is Sumami in sweet. Exactly. Sumami, yeah. That, that's me teaching you sweet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Say, <clears throat> send me. When times were difficult, when you knew that just going into the street to demonstrate peacefully could invite a bullet, could end your life. But she was there. You know, she did not preach from the podiums and all of them. She walked. That is why, to her last day, whenever she walked, even into the, uh, the squatter camps, whether it's in, wherever, in townships, people always ululate because they remember what that woman went through just so we can enjoy the freedom that we're enjoying today. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And Doc, um, His Excellency has so eloquently taken us through the initial struggle before the incarceration of Madiba. Um, you know, for women, contemporary women, uh, you suffer a stroke and the next thing she packs out of the house, she goes to her parents' house. <laughs> Where did she garner the resolve to be by the side of Nelson Mandela through those difficult times? And she was so adamant and persistent. She visited and visited, and her resolve was never broken. Where did she get that spirit from? Well, first, let me talk about one aspect that uh, His Excellency has not touched on. Uh, one thing that uh, Winnie Mandela has been noted for as well is um, her intelligence gathering, um, how she's been able to organize the youth. No uh, Facebook, no Twitter, no, no social media. media. The mainstream um, media was controlled by the apartheid authorities. Yeah. Um, organize the youth in such a way that um, they were always a step ahead of what any form of atrocities that. Uh, the apartheid regime has planned towards the black majority. And um, her intelligence gathering was two ways, trying to decipher what the white folks wanted to do against them, as well as to find out who the sellouts were among the blacks or the informants were among the blacks. And this is where she was so much beholden to the youth, students, and that sort of thing. And on the other hand, more serious one also, um, she has been very active also in gun running across borders, she, particularly. She could shoot an AK? Not shooting. <laughs> could she say, shoot an AK? <laughs> well, we say gun running. She was involved in arms smuggle. Yes. But she um, couldn't fire a shot, could is, she? Uh, <laughs> no, no, this is not an open battle as I you say. go to um, maybe arm robbery as we have it today. But you know, we have fraught line states like what? Um, um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, Angola, and the rest. And these countries were all what, uh, very pathetic to the plight of what? Uh, yes, uh, Africans. Yeah. So it takes some planning. In fact, uh, it was a kind of grandfather apartheid regime which was all seen all investigating. So in order to beat them, in order to get distance to your people was a big deal. Um, the other half of the question that... You are being <laughs> diplomatic, Doc. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, lofty stories are told about the struggle against apartheid. Yeah. Do you want to say somewhat it wasn't military, there were no confrontations? I can see you are trying to be a bit <laughs> diplomatic. No, what I'm <laughs> trying to say, for example, you, is that uh, Winnie Mandela was not having what arms around her mm -hmm. fighting on the street going. Okay. There were real fights at various places. 
But what she was offering was a kind of leadership, a kind of trust and assurance to that this is how we can get this. This is the right people into whose hands the arms can go to. This is how people can be protected if they are caught up with and that sort of thing. So it was more of the organization level and management level. No, the point that um, we still have women like Nelson Mandela, even in Ghana today, any situation into which you are born, you either try to do something about it, or you said, that is not my problem, and live the life of comfort that you want to live. Uh, we still have that, and that was what Nelson Mandela decided, sorry, Winnie Mandela <laughs> decided to do. And um, it was honorable. It was something that was what um, acceptable, something African. Um, as I was saying earlier on, it was something that permeated the whole of Africa. Nigerian musicians wanted to sing. Uh, Bob Mali wanted to sing about apartheid. Uh, Jimmy Cliff wanted to sing about apartheid. Um, Steve Wonder wanted to sing about apartheid. So it was a kind of pan-Africanist movement. But the level of consciousness, or what you call self-consciousness, was always there. This is a woman who was born, even if without a silver spoon, he had a wooden spoon <laughs> in her mouth, <laughs> that she could live in comfort and enjoy life uh, the way she wanted. But here she found out, as um, Actually, His Excellency was saying that they were dispossessed of the land. Their cattle was taken away. Mm -hmm. Their movement was restricted. At any time, you could be arrested, and you must carry a pass with you. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things, so that you are not a normal human being. That was the issue. Okay. And this is what she found out and realized that this is the right thing to do. This is what I have to fight for. This is what I have to do. And um, I think that is why we are honoring her today. That is why we are recognizing her today. Uh, if she had what, taken the easy way of life, she would have passed as any ordinary African or South African for that matter. And uh, for me, it is more of a lesson to us the living. You know, we still have problems everywhere in Africa. And what is important is that uh, we should what? face these problems and begin to discuss them and find solutions to them. Okay. That is what is done everywhere in the world. Okay, Doc. Yes. And tonight we are honoring women and we have the pleasure of hosting Deputy High Commissioner of South Africa to Ghana and His Excellency Tapelo Madomani. And then we have Dr. Ken Ahosu is with the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. Gentlemen, I'll come back to you shortly. Um, sometimes you reach a climax and soon you fall out with people. Um, her story is not filled with beds of roses. At <coughs> some point she fell out with people and became ever less popular. But we have on the phone a Ghanaian lady by the name Madame Abinan Kansa who has lived in South Africa for well over two decades. Since we are honoring women, we speak to her for a few minutes. Hello, Madam Abina. How are you doing, Madam Nkansa? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm superb. Thank you for making time with us. Thank you, too. What is the sense on the streets of Joburg, Cape Town, and Soweto as South Africa mourns a towering figure like Wedi Mandela? And what have been your discussions around pubs and in female circles since her death was announced uh, about a week ago? Um, can you repeat the question again? The line is not very clear. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Madam Abinan Kansa. Um, yes. Of course, since you are back to Ghana, um, you have yes. strong female contacts. Um, back there yes. in South Africa. What have you yes. and your friends been, been discussing about William Mandela since her death was announced a uh, little shy of a week ago? Um, I think that, you know, her death has 
um, reignited um, that whole um, topic and debate about, you know, apartheid and the role that a woman played um, in bringing, you know, freedom to the people of South Africa. Um, Winnie Mandela is a very unique um, icon in the sense that um, from her background, in terms of how the whole thing started and, you know, what transpired later on in terms of the demonizing of, of who she was, um, her death has basically, in a way, um, absorbed her of a lot of the things that she uh, was being accused of. You know, when, when I heard about what happened to her, I, I, I had very deep sorrow initially. Um, if you think about her background, she was a, a point of princess, and um, she came from a royal house, and she saw what apartheid did to her people in terms of the land um, grabbing from, you know, apartheid um, regime. And this left a very, you know, um, very, you know, poignant mark in her, in her mind in terms of the oppression that her people had, had gone through. She'd also seen what had happened when the woman went um, to um, march against um, John Foster, um, when um, against the, the parcels that they had to, you know, to to carry. And once she married uh, Mandela and became part of the movement, when she when Mandela was sent to prison. Um, the men, it wasn't just Mandela was sent to prison, but they were, all the men were rounded up and taken to Robben Island. And the, the, the aim of what they did in terms of imprisonment of masses of um, people from the ANC was to basically silence the movement. But it was women like Willie Mandela who took up the mantle very bravely and endured so much to ensure that the names of those who were in Robben Island stayed in the minds and the hearts of, of, of South Africans. Um, I don't know, she, she went through so much in terms of her um, imprisonment. She was in prison for 491 days in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. And if you understand what solitary confinement is, she was tortured. Um, she, was, <laughs> she, she went through so much. But, you know, in all of it, she's been so gracious and graceful about it. Never once did we hear her complain about the things that she had to endure to ensure that they were to, um, uh, the, uh, the people were free. I wanted to correct you on something with regards to her, um, you know, the un underground movement in Konto Wesiswe. She was a very vital element in it. Winnie Mandela could assemble an AK-47. <laughs> she was in the trenches with the men fighting the apartheid regime. Um, so she was a very capable revolutionary in her own right. And um, I'm glad that South Africans are seeing her for what she really is and who she really is. And they have embraced her and um, are celebrating her like the way she deserves to be celebrated. Okay. Unfortunately, for, for, for a long time, the, the media has given the wrong impression of who she is. But it is only in her death that people are starting to understand the great sacrifices that she made so that the people of South Africa could be free. Okay. Just last, I just want to add one more thing. Okay, she, said, um, she said something that was very important, that the, the, the fight, that the struggle that they, they fought was about political freedom and economic freedom. And though they had achieved political freedom, economic freedom was still not had still not been achieved. And that le lies with in, in the in land acquisition. And so I'm quite sure that the ANC uh, will look into how to make sure that the people of South Africa will gain, regain their political and economic freedom so that the fight that Winnie Mandela put up along with so many other um, icons and revolutionaries Will not be in vain. Okay, thank you so much for making time with us, Madam Abina Masa. That was quite, uh, mm -hmm. even though on the feminine side, yes. an, inter an important <laughs> intervention. And Doc, oh la la, yeah. the woman was shooting an AK and he was so <laughs> diplomatic about it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think what, <clears throat> what, what um, the caller was saying yeah. was her ability. Yeah. 
okay. which he he did not deny that exactly. he, she was able to do yeah. that. Yeah. The question of whether she went into active combat is another story. Okay. Uh, now, also, because we said we are honoring women, uh, women at home, uh, I hope that um, next time we meet to do this, you will be ably represented by <laughs> one of your own. Exactly. The composition of, <laughs> yeah. of uh, the this panel. panel yes. um, and it's good, and you know, um, Madam Abnan Kansa has always come handy mm -hmm. on some of these issues. Okay. okay. Um, we have a few more minutes to go. Um, do heroes or heroines suddenly become villains? Well, um, when, at what time did she <laughs> turn a corner? <coughs> Mother of the nation, I, those lofty yes. titular appellations. When did she turn a corner and suddenly... I, I wanted to say something when, when, when the caller was speaking, that, that sometimes um, we, we, in situations like this, especially where the opposition or the, yeah, the opposition has got all the means, controls media, controls, they can um, demonize a saint and canonize a demon, if you will. Uh, Winnie Mandela, whatever she did, was listened to. Remember earlier on the doctor was talking about, the good doctor was talking about intelligence. It was not only her, you know, she didn't have the monopoly of that. She had a more organized opponent, a more organized foe who had far more resources than herself. They would listen to what she says, they would look where she goes, with whom she's talking, and ever so conveniently, <coughs> here and there, uh, if they think that it will damage her reputation, throw it in there, accuse her of things that could, you know, if you repeat a lie often, yeah. often enough, often enough, she did, she did, she did. Yeah, they created, they, they, they kind of started to create doubt and many people said, could ha she have done it? Could it be that maybe, you know, there's this in every rumor, there's an element of truth. <coughs> the question was, which element of truth was there? But even during the Truth and, and, and Reconciliation Commission, we got to know the lengths that the apartheid regime went in order to discredit her. Earlier on, the doctor did allude to the fact that we're not saying she's spotless. We're not saying we're talking about a saint here. A saint here. <clears throat> no, we're not. We're talking about a woman who, at that point in time, during very difficult circumstances, conducted herself in a way that continues to amaze us to this day. That's what we're doing. We're not going to say, oh, she was without sin. Oh, no, she was without faults and all that. She may have her uh, faults. We will grant her that. But she is an extraordinary woman. And in Africa, we say, it's an age-old cliche, mm -hmm. that don't speak speak ill of the dead mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but I believe we need to pick up the pieces mm -hmm. and so that other towering women that come uh, in our history as a continent would also learn from the mistakes of our mm -hmm. forebears. Doc, would you say through your reading um, your scholarly literature has documented that she was corrupted by power well, I don't think that was the issue. Um, as the saying goes, a revolution is not a tea party. And um, the atmosphere or the, the morbid atmosphere within which they were living and conducting the affairs or resistance against this awesome apartheid regime, not only the resources that the apartheid regime had in South Africa, that they were ably supported by United States of America, supported about what? The Western countries, Great Britain and the rest, to the extent that uh, some were what? Called terrorists who were even in prison. So in situations like this, when you look at revolutionaries, you know, you are talking about what? Um, Fidel Castro. You are talking about um, Robert Mugabe. Uh, uh, Robert
Robert Mugabe. I wasn't going to call Robert <laughs> Mugabe to uh, talking about uh, the Russian uh, what revolutionaries. Even when we come to Ghana, we talk about what our honorable Dr. Um, um, Kwame Nkrumah. We talk of uh, J.J. Rawlings. Revolutionaries. There are mistakes that people commit, or in the heat of the activities, they didn't have the comfort or the luxury of time, a second guessing as we are doing today. So they took certain actions at, at the heat of the moment, uh, and that uh, reviewing their history, we can point out today in our comfort that they were wrong, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the comfort during that time. Because this was a war situation. You miss one step, you are dead. And here is a case, there was this guy, and the central issue about uh, Winnie is about the Zenzi. What's it? That's the name of the boy. That uh, he was what? Someone who was reporting the plans that... Uh, Stompy. Yeah, Stompy. Um, that um, ANC was carrying out as against appetite. So he was called and interrogated, and this is why they say uh, she was complicit in his yes, murder. Yes, he was compromising the process. That is one. Then there is one reverend, the name has escaped me, that the people say Winnie Mandela paid $8,000 uh, for him to be assassinated. But all this was justice of what? The apartheid regime, who was what? A party to the crisis, uh, a prosecutor, and at the same time, a judge in the situation. And as um, um, His Excellency has said, in this course analysis, once you keep repeating the same thing, trying the same case, tomorrow you are tried for this, this, and this, we say perception is not the truth, but it becomes reality. Uh, so this was the situation. So what I would say is that often when <laughs> I hear to history, I read to history of these great revolutionaries, I always give them the benefit of the doubt. Because even in comfort times like this, comfortable times like this, we make mistakes as human beings. Being in leadership at such trying moments that not necessarily make you angel, you are still human and you still make fall. But what is important today uh, is that we have to look at this woman, what she has done. <laughs> but for a person like her, Though every history will come to an end, uh, apartheid probably would have lingered on a bit longer than it has done. So I think this is where we have to praise her. Mm -hmm. Now we have to sing her praises, and not only that, but learn from it. Now the challenges that Africa still confronts Africa, this is an example that we can follow. And not so much by doing that, we should not commit mistakes, and our goal should be honorable. So in, the, in the dying embers of this discussion, um, Your Excellency, you are here serving, pursuing the interest of your country as a Deputy High Commissioner. You say South Africans are storytellers. How do we immortalize a giant figure like um, Winnie Mandela? How do we <coughs> make her story uh, linger on for? five centuries to come, a millennium to come? A life lived in the service of others. I think that's the summation of it all. Um, you know, at times, you find yourself in difficult situations and you ask yourself, how did I get here? If I knew that this road that I am treading bare feet has got thorns, the rest would have taken a smoother path. You wonder sometimes. Winnie and Nelson knew exactly what they were getting themselves into. It's not an accident that, oh, I wake up today and say, what happened? How did I come here? They knew their adversary. Mm -hmm. They knew how brutal and dehumanizing. They have seen people get hanged by their hundreds. And they were quite aware that could also very much be their fate. Their fate as well. <clears throat> so, in spite of knowing that, 
Winnie, Nelson, still continue down that, th that road. Mandela gets arrested. And that is why I was saying, it's not necessarily true that she was by his side. He was in Robben Island. She was there facing those brutal attacks day in, day out. She was the one, especially in the 80s, when talking ill of an unjust uh, uh, apartheid would get you into so much trouble. And they seem to be winning the propaganda, the communication war. But her voice was there. What she symbolized more than anything was hope that one day things will be all right. What she preaches about, what she says, let's not give up. Today, just before she passed, recently she was talking about the issue of political power that it did not necessarily or immediately transfer economic power into the hands of the majority. In South Africa, I think we are the most unequal society in the world. We are the most unequal society. So we still have challenge. We have those triple challenges. We call them inequality, poverty, and unemployment, which are not an accident of history. They were by design. But what she stood for and the message that she gave to people, two words, sacrifice and hope. That's what she gave us. Um, you know, during our days in uni, and Doc, you've been our lecturers all, these, all this while, we reference people, people who perhaps did not even author a single book, people who are overhyped. And recently, someone has even said Albert Einstein is a creation of Western literature. What do we do beyond this? All the soothing words uh, from His Excellency, the Deputy High Commissioner. Do we put pen to paper? Does a publishing house sponsor hundreds of thousands of copies of a biography? She didn't write a memoir, did she? Winnie didn't write a memoir. There, there is um, a biography. I don't know yeah, about a memoir, is. but there is an official biography. OK. I so think, how, um, what do we do? You I know? think uh, a fitting this now. All these people were fighting. Today, when you look at the political landscape in uh, South Africa, people are fighting for positions, presidency, prime minister, whatever you have them, ministerial positions. But this was a sacrifice. Fighting uh, apartheid during that time was a sacrifice that you live by the minute. <laughs> you are not even, uh, you cannot even see tomorrow. So these people were not fighting for any form of embellishment or any form of reward for themselves. But they were fighting for South Africans, black, so to speak, that this system appetite is not good. When we, what we are doing is to sacrifice. So they don't care actually what happens to them. Mm. From this perspective, what is important, a fitting legacy, to live for such icon is to what? Carry on the dream. The selflessness, fighting to liberate the last South African who does not have a shelter over his head, who doesn't have food on the table, who does not have the social amenities living in deplorable conditions. I think this is what we as Africans, particularly South Africans, have to do. Doc, to can you live. promise you write about Winnie Mandela and make it <laughs> a standard book at least yet? Can't you do this sacrifice? Uh, I would not. <laughs> I will not promise on TV <laughs> that this is what I'm going to do. I have a line of publications that I have not thought of, but I'll seriously think about it. Um, but sometimes when you are even thinking of these things, these days of social media, how many people are reading? Yeah. Um, that is another thing. <coughs> um, and then, um, who knows? Is there, an, a very is there a statue? Is there a statue in her memory anywhere in South Africa? I would not know of any. No, I don't think. Um, but I've, I've had uh, 
debates of late to say that. South Africans have not been grateful enough because Thabo Mbeki came into the picture, Jacob Zuma came. There was a lot of jostling for political power. Mm -hmm. And the very people who sacrificed, toiled and sweated have been forgotten so soon. No, man, normally it's after death, so I don't <laughs> think it's too late, apart mm. from people like Christiana Ronaldo who are having best in our <laughs> footballers <laughs> house. But normally political figures mm. is after they are gone. Why do you <laughs> honor people posthumously? <laughs> and, and the other and issue yeah, is this. Um, you know that her funeral will be on the 14th. Um, we're giving her um, a special official funeral. Will you open a book for um, a signa yeah. for signature? Actually, the book is already opened okay. Okay. It at, will, the high it, at the High Commission. It will remain open until the 14th. Um, on the 11th, um, at 6 o'clock in the evening, we'll have a memorial at the official residence. So we ourselves also, we have invited a um, women's group, uh, diplomatic community to come and eulogize and pay their last respect okay. to this icon. Okay, G gentlemen, in, in closing, mm -hmm. I would give each one of you one minute. I wish all African women were like Winnie, so in our times of distress, they would provide us solace and succor. But that is not always the case. They read more about Beyonce and Rihanna than they do about Yasantoa and Winnie. What are your closing remarks, Doc? And how do you imbue such lofty ideals in well, our um, I, as I have said earlier on, um, it is always good that we live with the times and uh, the challenges that Africa is faced with. It's not only for the women, it's for the men as well. That just as they have faced apartheid head on, uh, without any sight of victory, without any reward in promise, and yet they fought until what apartheid was dismantled. Um, I am calling on Africans for that matter, the youth, women, uh, men and the elderly, students, workers and hospitals, <coughs> and wherever we find ourselves. <coughs> we should not be grumbling, we should not be complaining, but we should do our little bit to make Africa what it should be among them. And a group of continents in the world. Thank, Thank you, you, Doc. And then Your Excellency. <coughs> my, my sentiments exactly, if I will. Um, I don't think many women would agree with you if you were saying you wish many of them were like. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it presupposes they are not. They should be close um, to her at <coughs> least. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, excuse me. I'm saying, what I'm saying is, when you say they should be like her, it, it presumes they are not. A few are or, not, or anyway. Yes, <laughs> but there are those who are very much like. And yeah. um, again, the, the doctor aptly said, when you say um, m they are uh, Facebook and all that and in the social media, so are the men. So I think it cuts <laughs> both ways. Okay. Anyway, um, women, the, 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 the glass ceiling is, has been shattered. Uh, we lived in the era of giants. Uh, Winnie Matigizela Mandela was not one of a kind. He was a sample of what women can do or what women have done. My challenge to the young women and to all the youth um, and to Africans is this. <clears throat> Educate yourself. Equip yourself. Let's make sure that Africa owns the 21st century. Let's beneficiate our own minerals. Let's build our roads. Let's trade amongst ourselves. Let us get closer. Let us be one. Let us make sure that we compete uh, with the, or we take our rightful place in the international community. And the only way we can do that is not because of the oil, the diamond, the gold, or the whatever we have. It is what we have on top, which is the human capital, that will make sure that we develop and we reach our optimal development. Winnie was an educated woman and she played her role. Let us play our role, and let that role be democracy and economic development. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I'll come back shortly to sign off, but, you know, off the cuff, there are quite a number of black Africans that can quote Abraham Lincoln, George Washington. So we leave you with a few quotes uh, from William Mandela, and make sure you use those quotations quite often. 
we show you a few. When they finish rolling, we come back and we sign off. Um, I don't know. Willie says, All too soon, you know, mm -hmm. we've been discussing the portrait of Woody Mandela, a South African anti-apartheid campaigner and the wife of former President Nelson Mandela. And thank you, viewers, and my warm regards to all of you, especially the Guruma people of Jindinfisa in Salaga, and the people of Kumbungu and the people of Kumasi. I've been in the studios with Deputy High Commissioner of South Africa to Ghana, His Excellency, Tapello. I like the... Miss uh, Brea. Okay. Tapello <laughs> Madumani. Thank you, sir, for making time. It's been a pleasure. And also Dr. Ken Ahosu with the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. Doc, thank you. Thank you. This show was ably produced by Celestina V and the rest of the production crew. So we come your way next week with another edition of Worldview. Good night and stay blessed.